Gail Banks. Gail Banks. Gail Banks. Gail Banks. Gail Banks. To call Gail Banks an engineer would be an understatement. This is Speed School with Gail Banks. School has begun. Welcome to Speed School. I'm Gail Banks. We're back with Walt Ware for a second episode. Let me bring you up to speed. Walt and I have known each other for 50 plus years, I would say. Walt's done some very interesting things in his lifetime, including working with me here at Banks for what? Over six years now. Over six years now. Walt and I are within five days of being the same age. Walt enabled me to to do some things with turbocharging when he went to Garrett uh, that turned out to be astounding and beneficial for both Walt and I and Garrett and Banks. We We had a lot of fun, too. Yeah, we really (laughs) promoted turbocharging. When we left off last time, Walt had gone to Garrett after being, uh, well, I think the highlight of his career up to that point uh, was engine development and test on the SR-71 Blackbird, the most badass aircraft I've ever laid eyes on. And there might be faster aircraft today. Nobody's really trotting out any numbers with any authenticity, but I don't think there'll ever be a more badass-looking aircraft. I think it's wicked. Oh, it's wicked. It's wicked. I have a model of it uh, in my office. If you are interested in any of that, Please listen to episode 10. That's where we started with Walt. Uh, Today we're going to do episode 11, and I I don't know if we'll be done today or not. There might be an episode 12. Uh, When we left off last time, Walt had talked to us about how Garrett came to make turbochargers in the first place, and it had a lot to do with Caterpillar coming to them and asking, you know, Caterpillar was interested in turbocharging. They designed a turbocharger. They asked the brain trust at Garrett to, you know, tell them if it would work, uh, what they would change, et cetera. That's kind of where we left off. And Walt, how did you get to Garrett? I don't think we've covered exactly how how that happened. That's that's kind of where we left off. Yeah. We kind of just, probably a good time we stopped. (laughs) But anyway. (laughs) Garrett Air Research I'm talking about here. And I think the Founder of the company was Cliff Garrett. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and we didn't rename the corporation until Garrett Corporation and Garrett Air Research until he passed away. Oh, because he didn't. He was that kind of a guy. So it was Air Research. It was Air Research Manufacturing Company. And you guys were doing aircraft uh, jet engines. At- we did jet en- all type. We did things for the space program. Uh, we actually made the jet suits for the Blackbird pilots. Because we made stuff, for, you know, for all this place exploration. Yes. yes. We actually had a uranium centrifuge in the basement called Department Thirty Seven. Oh my god! It was god. a two-story hole in the ground right off the four hundred five freeway. Yes. I mean, you can see the building. The building <laughs> several stories high, but it was it was as tall underneath the ground as above. And we re re energized uranium. We had a huge centrifuge. My God! I'm not kidding. <laughs> Who knew? Did the Atomic Energy Commission know about yeah, that? Yeah, we were under contract for that. Yeah, We made an artificial heart back in the 70s, a real... Air research. We were just a bunch of crazy engineers, I guess. But that was the greatest collection of, I would say, pure engineering guys who never accepted something couldn't be done. Yep. Oh, but some, even though some of my bosses told me something couldn't be we done. We have that problem here <laughs> at, at banks. I know. You know, we, we really do because... I think the biggest non-moving machine I've ever been involved in is my V8 house I'm building in Yosemite. What the hell am I doing? I'm a turbo guy. I'm an engine guy. What's with building the houses? You well, know? Yeah. you know what I was doing at that time? I had a custom cabinet shop. Yes. I totally fed up with a corporate life. I'd been through one more. Now, now this is more recent. This is after a whole bunch of decades. Yeah. Well, just because you brought up the Yosemite house. Yeah, you know, exactly. I had this custom cabinet shop. You've been there. You and Vicky yep. were there. Yep. Actually, I made I made sample doors. I had the whole all the cabinetry in the whole house designed. Yes. And then the recession happened. and you know, A whole bunch of stuff. A happened. whole bunch happened. A whole lot yeah. of things for you and you I know, both. This is one of those, the, the V8 house, actually from a satellite image. You can see it's a V8, you know, from yeah. the air. Like you're facing the front of a V8 engine. But from the air. 
But back to how many how many years were you at Air Research? Twenty two years. Twenty two. Twenty two years. We got some digging to do here. So how did you get there? Well, you look at the front cover of Aviation okay. Week magazine. Well, how about that? Yeah, what I'm looking at is a, the cover of Aviation Week with a fellow and a jet engine. The fellow worked for Walt at Pratt & Whitney. And a number of Garrett engine images. That's uh, an engine tech who was a tech for me at, in Pratt & Whitney. Uh huh. And Garrett decided to build an extremely advanced turbo fan jet engine in the smaller scale you know not for yes, commercial for, airlines yes but uh, and but for br- private jets things like private jets made military applications was bill lear doing anything at that point we powered his airplanes damn and we now, used them for test frames for our, our new stuff isn't this cool the lear jet w- w- was powered by air research well we had to repower them because they started out with a little ge ge yeah. and they were weak socks they were they were weak <laughs> that, and that airplane flew that thing flew it didn't fly flat it didn't have the the thrust to level out I'm, i swear if you watched them fly they didn't fly like on the circumference of the globe you're trying to go around yeah yeah it yeah i'm really yeah. I'm they really were tail yeah. heavy i guess you'd say <laughs> I got to tell you, uh, only one time I've ever been in a Learjet, uh, I was doing a, two engines for uh, the owners of Circus Circus and consulting them on their Gold Cup boat. So it's two guys named Bill owned Circus Circus. I did two engines for them. They flew me to Tahoe to tune it at altitude in their Learjet with a clown on the tail. And I think the, I think the aircraft was pink. Uh, it had a phone in it. This is way back when. Uh, it had a phone in it, uh, which was a radio telephone, I guess you would call it. And I called my wife. <laughs> Hi, honey. Yeah, hey. I mean, How's it going? I'm at 30,000 feet. <laughs> in that in that Learjet. Yeah. So I've been in one once. So how did you get to Gary? So what happened? You know, like we, we talked about my interview with Al Silver in our last pod we were kind of like kind of things the yeah, way things yeah, ended yeah, up at, yeah you were button heads. At pratt and wendy yeah you know i thought about this more over the weekend because you sent me that youtube thing on the j58 engine mm-hmm. so you got me going again so i spent all weekend like my brain cooking right <laughs> so and then i think i sent you something back back and forth but uh the core platform for the u.s supersonic transport was based on a bigger j58 mm-hmm it was the core. Yes. And uh, then the U.S. government canceled all the SST. Everybody working on it in America. The British kept yes. going with the Concorde. For, it it know, became the yeah. Concorde, so yeah. to speak. Yeah. 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 yeah, but that was all European. Yes. We, I just found, because I was searching on the web, an article that there's a secret program that's about two years old yeah. that's not public, and it's, I don't know if it's a rumor or what, but they're talking about an SR seventy two. I've heard that too. You mentioned that the other day. Yeah. So you got my you got my brain going. I'm yeah. thinking, why don't I know about that? <laughs> <laughs> I should know about that. <laughs> so this just this morning when I came in, I went searching and uh, I found a little bit of a, a little bit of a story on it. I mean, we can talk about that later. But it's kind of inter- and they're they're looking at the J fifty eight as a base platform. Oh, really? As, obviously, yeah. more refined. I mean, that's indeed. a 60-year-old engine, yes, right? Yes, indeed. But uh, they still haven't, to my knowledge, anywhere built on that and leveraged it. Right. You know? There's and, a lot a lot to leverage lot. there. Kind of means like you and I, we go back to Buki and turbochargers. Mm-hmm. I mean, he was the mm-hmm. first guy way back in Switzerland, right? Yeah, exactly. You dig, know, you dig, talk about turbocharging. Diesel had done the his Rudolph, engine. Rudolph Diesel. Rudolph Diesel yep. had done his engine. One of the uses, early uses was railroad locomotives. Very large diesel engines, yeah. huge. But as they went up into the Alps, and I believe Buki was Swiss. He was Swiss. So the Swiss Alps, they started starving for air density. Uh, hopefully, there was some way to lean the engine out, you know, so you could maintain the correct mixture and didn't put out a hell of a lot of smoke, burn the fuel in the engine. Among other diesel applications that Buki was looking at, this was one that really needed a turbocharger. Right. It kind of started it. It justified it. Yeah. Right? It was the foundational justification. Exactly. You had guys, I think Nicholas Otto had done the, uh, patented the internal combustion 
a process with a, the crank and the, mm-hmm. you know all the and that would be 1886 is the I auto recall. cycle yeah. yeah the auto cycle uh, O T T O not A U T O <laughs> but the automobile is a, kind of an Americanization of an O T T O mobile that's right that's right <laughs> and I've used both as trademarks I I got some of our early tuners I called O T T O mind I know. <laughs> yeah, and uh, people didn't get that. What the hell is an auto mind? You know, diesel then came with the engine, his engine, compression ignition, eighteen eighty eight in the eighteen eighties. Yeah, like, yeah, somewhere 83, in there. 80, I don't remember exactly. And either. then Buki came with the turbocharger, right, for trains, railroad, and big ships. Yes, because they were all diesel powered. Exactly, and they guys have built non turbocharged diesel engines. My wood chipper doesn't have a turbo. Dork Troy Diesel did it for decades. My little John Deere uh, doesn't have a turbo. My little John Deere lawn tractor. And I'm dying to put turbos on those things, especially the wood chipper because I use it in Yosemite. You need a T1. I know I need a T1. I have one. <laughs> about the size of a pocket watch. You know? <laughs> about the diameter of a pocket watch. Yeah, 50 cent piece. Yeah. yeah. I'm still dying to know. Tell us the story so, so, of how so, you got to Garrett. So what you, happens? You, 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 I told you. You got, you got interviewed I told you when I, when I decided my career wasn't with Pratt & Whitney anymore. Right. Because they lost the program that Indeed. I, I wanted to be on. Yeah, yeah, and, and Garrett and, was a state-of-the-art yeah. engine, and they recruited around the world Rolls-Royce, GE, Pratt & Whitney. <laughs> I mean, they were building they a team. They came to the town you were in. Yeah. They, well, I told you a story that I went there in my Z16 Chevelle. Oh, and, yeah. This stuff is really cool in episode 10. Anyway, so Al Silver came to town. They had this program, but Garrett didn't make really prime propulsion engines. Mm-hmm. They made a lot of APUs and so on and so forth. Ah. They made some turbo props, uh-huh. but they had actually never made a turbo fan. Uh-huh. In fact, turbo fans came you know, after turbo jets. So okay. APU, auxiliary power unit. Yeah, for all the air conditioning, heating, ventilation, electrical That's, power, electrical power on the airplane. Exactly. They and Garrett made all the hydraulics. I mean, they they did so much stuff. It was amazing. Like, yes. I mean, it was like a playground for and it got better. A kid like me, there. like it was a playground there. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, <laughs> so they were recruiting everywhere, and they came to town, and I was, I didn't see a future at Brent Whitney, and so I was one of the guys they recruited to help them build this whole new engine. Engines up to then were single spool, right? Mm-hmm. The J58 was single spool. Even then, there weren't like turbo fans where they did a lot of high bypass and yes. used the air as thrust in addition to the gas generator. Indeed. Driving the, the gas generator drove the fan, mm-hmm. you know, and the fan put out a more thrust than the core engine. Yeah, absolutely. But the core engine still processed heat and had thrust coming out the back too. Mm-hmm. So you had... You could say cold thrust and hot thrust if you want to get okay. to that. Okay. And we're just compressing air and making it dense. Right. Right. So this engine was three spool. The Garrett engine. The Garrett engine. Yeah. Nobody had ever done that before. I don't know. It's pretty tricky. Okay. Yeah. Turbojet engines, even the F-100 for the F-14, we talked about that a little bit. Mm-hmm. That was my last assignment at Bratton Whitney. Yes. But it was way in the future. It wasn't going to happen in my, in my frame, mm-hmm. time frame. Mm-hmm. It was a fan. It was a turbo fan jet. And to have a big fan and weight so important on an aircraft carrier Mm -hmm. that uh, we decided to try to develop the first composite, first stage fan. Yeah. So nobody's ever made a carbon fiber turbojet engine fan before. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so I didn't see that in the near term. And uh, I wasn't happy with working for contracts, quite frankly. Mm-hmm. And this was a commercial project for Garrett. But Garrett also made turbochargers, as you well, well know. Didn't you? Yeah. Okay. So you you went there. I went there to get into turbochargers. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Uh, but this was a really exciting program. We actually took the air. We had a high bypass fan. I forget the ratio. It might have been three to one. All right. I'd have to look back how much air went through the outside right. versus through the core. We call yes. it the core engine, mm-hmm. the gas generator. But after that, it went through the two stage compressor. Mm-hmm. Okay, a multi-stage axial flow compressor. These right. are both axial. Yes. From there, it went through a centrifugal compressor, like a turbocharger. Ah. The third stage was, was a turbocharger. I'll be damned. And that was the high-pressure gas generator. Yeah. It also had 
the third stage of the turbine was a radio flow turbine. So getting high pressure radio ratio, I remember the Latham axial flow superchargers for mm -hmm. various uh, early 50s, 60s engines. Axial flow, but not a lot of pressure ratio. Mm -hmm. And he didn't, I think, all of the stages were the same diameter. Probably. They didn't, they didn't. He, he didn't squeeze it down on subsequent stages. Uh, so they didn't make a lot of pressure. So your first two stages in the engine you're talking about were axial flow. Then you went to mixed or centrifugal? Centrifugal. Okay, so you mm -hmm. went to centrifugal. That's where you made the pressure ratio, I would think. Right. That was what we called a high-pressure gas generator. Yeah. That little sucker was kind of driving them driving the whole th the whole show right Got the it. turbocharger was driving the show yeah <laughs> okay because it goes beyond that that goes to a hypersonic research engine mm -hmm. based on the core generator so this engine turned the air through 720 degrees before it went out the exhaust from the time it came in the fan yep you're doing a lot of work on the air yeah right? you're also sucking a lot of energy out including out of the exhaust so you, the air comes in uh, the entry face of the engine and then it makes a u-turn well, it's the fan. Is and it a 1E? E? No, it's, there's actually two stages of, let's this, call it This 720 straight. degrees. That's what I'm curious about. The air comes in. Yeah, through the you, fan, and, the and fan first. Gonna, it goes out on the same axis as it comes in. Yeah, exactly. All right? Yeah, but, exactly. But, but, <laughs> but you do 720 degrees. Reason turns. Uh, ah, okay. Because to get through the, the centrifugal radial machine, yeah. it's... It, you know, well, that's 90 degrees. Yeah, we do. You have to look at the whole thing. But we want to talk about turbochargers. All right. This was also the very first full authority digital engine control. Ah. Very first. What year are we talking about? 68. Huh. I heard my buddy uh, Brian Suits the other day. He's on the air up in Seattle, 770 KTTH, 6 to 9, drive time weekdays. And he was talking about North Korea and how uh, Russia is going to North Korea to get weaponry. Uh, what? Yeah, yeah. Well, because they gave it to him first, right? Well, Putin's buying stuff from them. Uh, artillery rounds. I don't know what all, but suits is so much time in the military all over the world. And he's smart as a whip. So he's talking about the North Koreans... They don't have to worry about, you know, microprocessors failing in any of their equipment yeah, pretty basic. because it's all analog. <laughs> you know, <laughs> there's no electronics. So uh, if you set off a nuke nearby, uh, the electromagnetic pulse won't hurt a thing. They're still running around. You're talking about a digital control system that leverages microprocessors. Exactly. Garrett was a leader there, too. Yeah, it sounds one of the like first it. handheld. So you had some double E guys there? Dr. John Mason. You know Dr. John oh, Mason. Oh, yeah. Designing that circuitry. Right. And those right. controls. Right. I love there it. There were a lot of smart kids there. I mean, we weren't all kids. Yeah. But, but uh, I'll show you this because I got this out of the arc. I'd kind of forgotten some of this. But World War II, there were a lot of really smart German engineers, right? Yes. At the end of World War II, the Russians were trying to get them. And... America was trying to get them. Yep. Quite a story there. Several of those called Operation Paperclip. Mm -hmm. Some of those guys Garrett got. And I worked under them. <laughs> like a colonel from the Air Force. <laughs> yeah, from the German Air Force. Dr. Ted von der Noodle. Yeah. Well, and Werner von Braun. Uh huh. He, was, he wasn't at Garrett, he was in, in a different program. Oh, yeah. And then another guy named Helmut Schelp. And then the guy that was on diesel submarines with turbochargers for the Nazi sub, Wolfgang Lang, he worked right at, I mean, he had a desk near me when I got to the turbocharger business. Guys, you're really hearing, <laughs> hearing something here. And I want to contribute to this. When we went, we wanted to capture documents and employ their scientists and engineers. This is after World War II. Yes. Some genius said, if the guy's married, we're not bringing his wife. And we're not bringing in kids. We want to keep this affordable. I'm telling you, this went down. So like at Pinamunda and places like that, where the rocket scientists were. Yeah, we're going and, 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 and we might have brought some married guys. I don't know. But we, we tended not to 
and the Russians gladly took them. They didn't, they didn't give a damn. We're just going to take the train. We're not going across an ocean or in aircraft to get them to the United States like, like the United States is doing. You hear of decisions that have incredibly negative re repercussions. If we were on our game back then, Russia wouldn't have had a rocket program. No way. Because Germans ran that rocket program. Right. The Bose bomb. Until, oh, way beyond that. Yeah. Way beyond that. Yeah. Stuff that launched satellites, yep. stuff that went to the moon. Those guys aged out. You're right. You're right. Yeah. The people we brought here from Germany aged out as well. But look at von Braun's career, and he was just one of them. One of many. Yeah. I, I used to call them semi-converted Nazis. Yeah, well, if you I haven't had to work for one, you wouldn't... Yeah, yeah, yeah you wouldn't even say I that. I called them Prussians. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Prussians. That's... that's, that's they that's, didn't consider that a compliment. <laughs> All right. But my, uh, my, my ultimate turbocharger engineering boss, Hans Eggley, mm -hmm. he, always, he always said he was Swiss. We always said he was Prussian, and it wasn't a good thing if he heard you say that. Oh. <laughs> it was not a good thing. But he was a beautiful guy, actually. I mean, he was... I had an interview with him to get the job in turbochargers. Yeah. You didn't get a job in the turbocharger business unless Hans Egli put his stamp on you. And he would give you tests. Now, what? Like, he would give you a test. You'd say, you're on an isolated island in the middle of the ocean, and all you have is a slide rule. Uh -huh. And here's the problem. How are you going to solve it? I swear. Uh, yeah. You can't make it up. Well, I mean. <laughs> but we all were versatile with slide rules. Yeah. Yeah. You but, know. But the problem was the we trick. We didn't have that TI no, engineering no. calculator. You know. No. That. When I got to the turbo business, and Garrett had made some simple calculations. They were just they were just like doing business, like, you know, counting money kind of things. You know yeah. what I mean? They were adding in subtraction machines. Yeah. They might have, maybe they multiplied and did interest or percents. I mean, they, they weren't engineering things. Yes. The first HP 25, Garrett would let you take $5 out of every paycheck. You could buy one, and but, I mean, they, you paid for it, but they took it out of your check, and they gave you one. Yeah. That was an HP 25. And how much did it cost? It might have been $190. Yeah. I don't know. It was a lot of $5 out of my paycheck. <laughs> <laughs> but gas was cheap then. That's yeah, all. well, yeah. <laughs> anyway. But this is all kind of important to even where we are today. This was the first full authority, digitally controlled jet engine. I don't, there, I don't think there, there were no digitally controlled cars in. Not at all. No. This is a three-spool engine. So you got to synchronize three rotating groups. Mm -hmm. I can't imagine doing that with analog control no. a hydraulic no. computer like you had no. on the exterior the, of the j58 yeah, the blackboard was a hydraulic it was called you would call it because, fluidics it's called fluidics yes i they know had the, you, you, i mean that was the whole thing for me yeah. i could parallel mechanical engineering fluidics to electrical engineering that was a crossover yes right? but it was the, the the engine got so hot no electronics. No, way, no electronics would survive no. no so it was done with a hydraulic computer brain. yeah hydraulic brain mm-hmm it's amazing. it's amazing. I got to get you to the turbochargers. So I'm jones jonesing now. Okay. I, do, I really right, need a right, turbo fix. So anyway, this was <laughs> a really. You and I should talk about the ATF three offline. Okay. Okay, and we can we can go through that because that was a fascinating program, and the head guy, he was like the top engineer then, the mm -hmm. Ted Vondernoll, and Helmut Shelf was another guy, and they were the top engineers on jet engines in Germany. Yes. In fact, Vondernoll even worked on turbochargers in Germany. He <laughs> was like the head of the turbo machinery, whatever. You got to realize all this stuff with internal combustion, compression ignition, internal combustion, and turbocharging all happened in probably a 200-mile yeah. radius. Austria, Switzerland, Germany. These guys are right there. It all came from the same place. So to talk about... Germans having turbocharging char charging in World War II, it would be a miracle if they didn't. You but, know, uh, th th but they, you know how we beat them with turbochargers. I understand. You know that we had aircraft engines that were centrifugally supercharged, and we had aircraft engines that were turbocharged. Both. Uh, B twenty nine. Uh, I think it was. You probably know. P thirty eight was turbocharged. The P thirty. You know this guy. He's not my dad either. <laughs> 
So tell me who I'm looking at here. Sanford A. Moss. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Superchargers for Aviation. So, Harlan, we've got your book from the, <laughs> that you, you checked out the Garrett Library. <laughs> I checked it out. <laughs> he retired forever ago. Yeah. So He ran the library, actually. He was a librarian. <laughs> yeah, I'm holding up a hardbound book, Superchargers for Aviation by Dr. Sanford A. Moss. Uh, and it was published by the New York National Aeronautics Council, Incorporated, in 1942. All about, and then uh, you you go uh, developments underlying the supercharger, turbocharger arrangement, a uh, supercharger arrangement in use, supercharger history, details of superchargers in general, and then chapter six, turbochargers. There you go. And he's talking in 1942 about that. We had jet technology. Whittle was developing jet engines in the UK. I don't know who was developing jet engines here during World War II. Pratt was early because mm-hmm. they took off on you know what other people were doing. November 1917, the peak of World War I. Yes. GE President E.W. Rice received a note from NASA. This guy Moss was working on it to turbo supercharge the engine because it lost power to recover its power at altitude. So, may I see that? Yeah. So the it's deal just cut here, yeah. Yeah. So they came up with probably the Liberty aircraft engine, which, which I think was a V8. They had an, an altitude record without a, a supercharger or turbocharger, naturally aspirated. I'm going to say it was like 17,000 feet. Yeah, bare, yeah. No, no, don't hold me to this. Not more than 20, for sure. They developed a turbocharged uh, version and put it on a truck bed and went to the top of Pikes Peak. That's right. The dynamometer was on the truck bed as well. Uh, it swung a propeller during test. Probably it. Is that the test it bed? Might or be. It might be. I've got it in here somewhere. Yeah. Essentially, what the turbocharger does, what supercharger does, is it increases air density. And the problem with going to high altitude is a lack of air density. So you make best power at sea level with a naturally aspirated engine. And when you get to the top of Pikes Peak, about 14,110 is where the donut shop and gift shop is. They drove it to that altitude. At that altitude, I think we're down about 42% on air density. Yeah, something like that, yeah. Anyhow, they dinered it. It was successful. They equipped an aircraft with it, and they increased the altitude record by over 10,000 feet. You're like in the teens, 17, 18,000. Suddenly, you're in the high 20s. Now, you've really got a thermal problem for the aviator. It's cold up there. That's right. You know, and there's no oxygen for him. Developing oxygen systems for high altitude. <laughs> the whole thing. It was Garrett again. All of it was going on. It was all Garrett again. It was all going on. Heat transfer. That's your first turbocharged aircraft engine. Once the turbocharger was known, I don't see any reason anybody uh, continued to make supercharged engines. A lot of that World War II stuff, uh, the engines were developed in the t- late 20s into the 30s, etc., as were uh, a lot of the aircraft. You know, we really accelerated our aircraft development during World War II. Uh, The ultimate, most sexy thing I've ever seen out of World War II is the P-51 Mustang. Mustang. I love that bird. And and, uh, to my knowledge, that was never turbocharged. It was supercharged. Uh, In fact, the early ones, I think, used naturally aspirated Allison V-12s. We shipped some to England. The English didn't really think much of the performance because they wanted to get altitude. And here you are in World War II with this beautifully engineered aircraft and a naturally aspirated Allison aircraft engine in it. So they, in England, not only named the aircraft, the Mustang name came from the English uh, and stuck, uh, but they also put the Rolls-Royce Merlin uh, into there and similar space claim in the nose of the airplane, but supercharged. And there might have even been two-stage supercharged versions or Mm -hmm. two-speed superchargers Mm -hmm. might be more accurate. And suddenly that thing turned into... A beast. A beast. (laughs) Yeah. And if you see (laughs) Top Gun Maverick, 
you'll see Tom Cruise flying his P-51, his two-seater, towards the end of that movie. That movie, there's nothing woke about that movie. Nope. There, there's nothing politically correct about that movie. It's unabashedly patriotic. It's beautiful. And pro-American. And a grown-up. It's not. He acted like a, an adult instead of a kid this time. Yeah. <laughs> it's an adult movie. And that movie right now, without going to China, is the fourth highest grossing movie of all time. And it's still in the theaters. Right. I'm going to see it again. It, that is an American's movie. It is, indeed. There hasn't been one in a long time. Yeah. And, you know, they did mess around with one of the badges on their jacket. Well, we're jacket. talking about the Taiwan. Apparently, uh, there's quite a family thing with uh, Tom Cruise's dad. I'm looking into it. Yeah. But regarding that, that Taiwanese logo, and uh, I, I, I understand that the reason, one of the reasons it's not showing in China is Cruz, that logo remained on, on the his jacket. jacket. Yeah. They tried to take it off. In fact, they, from what I've read, they even tried to pull some funding because they wanted it off, but yeah. it stayed on. Yeah. <laughs> Cruz was apparently financially involved in the making of the movie, <clears throat> so he's, he's got some say. You know, I've always liked him as an actor, but the original Top Gun, uh, I liked him a lot more when he did that. And this one? Really good, though. Oh, my God. If you haven't and, seen it. And all the flight stuff. All I got to say is, uh, if you haven't seen it, guys, go see this movie. We're talking aircraft again. We need to make the transition. Well, we're really talking turtles. turbos. Yes. And I, I just want to, because it's in this book, the Boeing B-17 Flying Fortress and Consolidated B-24 Liberator the Boeing 1935 model souped up with this new turbo supercharger yeah. could carry a heavy bomb load to 34,000 feet. There you go. The Nazi planes, the, they couldn't get to them. The fighters couldn't take them down. Yes. And they had belly machine guns they could shoot down. Uh-huh. <laughs> and so they just flew over Germany and bombed the hell out of it. They couldn't knock them down with their well, fighters. Well, ultimately, the Germans got there. But the other, Not the fast other, enough uh, to win the war. The <laughs> other deal is uh, the artillery uh, couldn't. Get to him. The German 88. Oh, yeah, the big 88s. That was on the Panzer tanks was originally an aircraft weapon. Yeah. Anti aircraft. Anti aircraft -aircraft weapon. Kick it up to that altitude. It was engineered to. That was was a design point. Produce flak at the altitudes we were flying at. Yeah, yeah. We didn't have that very long. Then we started, guys started getting shot down, and more uh, American pilots were killed in those raids, uh, pilots and crews were killed in those raids than Americans that were killed in the island campaigns. Really? Really? A lot of Marines really? and Army guys. And you, you see those movies of us working through the islands oh, yeah. Guadalcanal and just and grinding that. them out yeah. and on yeah. every one. Yeah. And you think, God, that's, we lost more guys yeah. in My the My father-in-law was in Guadalcanal. In Europe. Than, yeah. Yeah. That was a dangerous occupation, but it got less dangerous. P-51 had performance, one element of which was range. They could go there with them and come back with Right, them. right. So, so you're at Garrett. What was your first turbo assignment? That's how you and I met. I was in the jet engine business. Yep. And, you know, doing neat stuff that I enjoyed. In fact, my job was they didn't even have a test facility to test this ATF-3 engine. There was... We built what was called Site B, and actually I built an open-air test stand before we had test cells to start running the engine. Mm -hmm. So I was kind of like the manager of the whole test facility for the ATF-3. Yes. And then, and of course, we had like a fuel lab where we worked, where we tested the digital fuel controls and all Mm -hmm. that. I mean, we went, it was a whole development program. You know, we, we had fan rigs. First, you developed a fan. I talked about that at Pratt and Whitney. Yeah. You had a fan, and you had to develop the fan to do what it was supposed to do, and this, and then we had the high pressure gas generator. It's like it could run it by itself. And what year are you talking about? Oh, uh, I joined October sixty-nine. Sixty. I signed up October sixty-eight when that magazine was published. Oh, and you reported January. <laughs> I didn't get there till January one. Yeah. Because of the F fourteen thing of sixty-nine. Yeah. Yeah. This I would be go like over seventy or so. The, when I went to the turbos. Yeah. Yeah, I would go over there like every six months and, and see if they had any openings, right? And I'd go to HR and just say, do you have any openings? Yeah. And, of course, they never had any. And it was a tiny company then. I mean, yeah. it was tiny. So then uh, 
the CAFE standards came in. Okay, fuel economy. And, and they were going to be forced sometime after 72. Mm-hmm. And they also began all the emissions requirements at the same time. Yes. General Motors gave Garrett a contract, and they gave us a an early 1972 Monte Carlo, and they gave us, like, they gave me, I don't know, half a dozen, a dozen engines. It wasn't too long before I had already, and you came to that test facility that I bought for Garrett mm-hmm. in in Lomita. Yes. The one with 24 test cells. Yes. Right. So they gave us the car. It they was gave a white engine company. It was Vickers at one time, then it was a, then it was white advanced products, where yeah. they were trying to make a gas turbine truck engine. Right. And that didn't all work out. Right. So, so I got the job to go buy that building, right? Yes. I don't know. I get all these crazy jobs. Like, I'm an engineer. Why do I go buy a building, right? Yeah. <laughs> but but anyway, <laughs> that's happened more than once. Yeah. But uh, about 100,000 square feet of uh, what could be the factory. Mm-hmm. And you had to be at the original turbo business up at Arborvita and Aviation mm-hmm. with you and all that. Yeah. I mean, we had a tiny lab. I forget how many. Yes. We had maybe four test cells, yeah. something like that. And they weren't very sophisticated. <laughs> but uh, so anyway, we we ultimately, they ended up being a parking lot. And we had this whole new thing in Torrance at the Lamita right. that we bought. Over the years, I had had another 100,000 square feet to it. And it was a two-story building. So they got Tell this. Tell me, what were the engines? They were uh, 350s. Chevy's. Chevy 350, I small gotcha. block. Uh-huh. But they were like the the best engine in the 72 Monte Carlo. Mm-hmm. They gave us one that was red with a vinyl top and all this stuff, right? So was this the racing group at GM? No, no. This no, no. This, this had in- nothing to do with racing. Gotcha. This gotcha. had to do with EPA. Aha. Okay. Uh-huh. This had to do with CAFE. The, mo- the motivation. CAFE. Being. Yeah. The kind of the problem statement was, how do we maintain at least the same performance level with all the other stuff we have to do right. to meet fuel economy and emissions? Yes. And you probably remember this. The very first Hariba lab was somewhere up Sepulveda Boulevard or somewhere mm-hmm. up near the airport. Yeah. It was the only one, probably maybe, I don't know, anywhere, maybe, yeah. maybe in Europe. It was brand new, you know, in one cell. And so. Now, Horiba being emissions test equipment uh, at at that time. Yeah, they were the they were the leaders, you know. They were kind of the AVL of emissions testing. Yeah, around the world, they had this contract and they didn't have enough. Everybody else was busy, so they hired me to do that. Mm-hmm. So that's how I got from the jet engine business to, to the, the turbo, turbo business. business. <laughs> I mean, this, nobody ever done this before, right? Yeah. Once again, one of the funny, interesting things was. Besides getting the performance and going through all the stuff, lean best torque, mean best torque, we're after fuel economy now, right? Absolutely. Without losing, without losing performance. Yes. So, in the beginning, you know, we had lab techs and guys that ran the engine, but but I was pretty much always there because that's what I like I like to do, right? Sure. And uh, we got to where we would get into all these detonation modes, and you could lose an engine real quick, right? It was against all OSHA rules, but we used to take a broom and prop the the lab door open because the lab doors are to let in cooler. yeah they're like you know 12 inches thick to keep the noise in, yeah right so we had the door open literally with our ears listening for detonation yeah right yeah so after we lost an engine or two i thought this is really not the best and my hearing's not the best anymore from so from, we're about 1970 71 early 70s okay yeah, probably 71 about the time because i did the vehicle work we didn't mess around cars. well let me let me throw a couple a couple of things here uh this guy at the GM Tech Center in Warren, a name Jim Curry. Did you ever hear his name? I know the name. I okay. don't remember. I, uh, not using Garrett product, using Ray J product, I developed lab engines for him. He invented the detonation sensor. Wait a minute. <laughs> Hold it right there. <laughs> okay. Because the, remember the broom and the door? Yeah. Okay. Well. <laughs> I had an instrumentation lab. You know how I'm about data being a data monster. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So I got my Bill Jennings, my laboratory electronic guy, mm-hmm. and uh, I went in there and I said, look, from my one of my books from Georgia Tech, uh-huh. uh, I went in there and I kept researching this. You probably know this. Detonation trigger point, when it all happens, is right around 5,500 cycles a second. That's the signature. Jim called that. The signature of detonation. You can call it whatever you want. You pick it out of all the other trash. All right. So You, had to, you have to discriminate. So I had accelerometers, mm-hmm. and then I went and bought 
a cathode ray tube scope called a mini ubiquitous. <laughs> what a name. I, st- I still remember the name, right? Yeah. And we could filter. So then we worked that all out. And so we knew when it was like incipient and then we were in it deep. But you yeah. could catch incipient detonation before it ever gets bad, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. We did all that. I shared it with GM. GM, like Caterpillar, I did so many things. And they would say, well, we own it because you did it for us. Caterpillar did that to me for yeah. water cool bearing housings, for water cool turbine housings. Yeah. Garrett would give you $25 if you got a patent. And my time was worth a hell of a lot more to me than 20. I'm not going to sit down and write patents, right. you know. Yeah. You know, <laughs> if, and for 25 bucks, <laughs> you know, get your name in the company newspaper, you know, you got a patent. We're doing so much here at Banks. But see, you can own the patents. Uh, yeah. I couldn't. Yeah. What, <laughs> what I'm saying is I want to sympathize with you because sitting down, I got four or five of them in my head right now, literally. I'm sure you do. And years go by, and every year that goes by, they're still there. I did one a couple of years ago on uh, engine oil control in the sump and in aeration. Yep, parasitic losses. Parasitic losses, all of that. Developed the system to improve that, which is only used uh, on the engines we produce for the Army. I haven't uh, done you have, you have a hot rod down? version You haven't of locked it. it down yet? It's locked down. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. Okay. Gotcha. All right. All right. It, it, it's, I got that patent in less than a year. You know, being over 65, you, you get to go to the head of the line. Uh, so I didn't know that. Yeah. Is that true? Yeah. Up to when I was 65, my patents took two to four years. I know. That's why I just two, didn't have a time to run through it. the process. I was already on the next thing. I just, <laughs> but this on the, my lube oil aeration and, and, and temperature control. Parasitic reduction. Your differential? Not one claim was challenged by the patent examiners. It went through because nobody nobody had ever done what I did. And it freaking works. Anyhow, I'm working on a, a new patent that doesn't rely on the old. But that's not the subject of this. You know, no, Walt it's... didn't want to do the patents because he wanted to make this stuff. And and research it and and evolve. The and once it worked, charger. I was went on the next yeah, thing. That's a whole different podcast if we ever do it. The turbocharger, you know, it's the thing. Back in the day, when I was fresh with the turbochargers and working with Hugh McGinnis, well, he came from TRW. He did the Corvair. He did the Corvair uh, turbo setup, uh, which was a TRW turbocharger. And then TRW, in their infinite wisdom, sold off the turbocharger enterprise to a customer who did aircraft turbo kits at the Long Beach Airport, Ray J. Ray J. Which was probably two guys, Ray and Jay. And he went there from I know TRW. Yeah, I know. So uh, I'm dealing with him on my early marine stuff, late 60s, I guess. You're doing this vehicle and engine project based on the small block Chevy. When I did Jim Curry's lab engines, I turbocharged a 183 cubic inch version, a three liter Iron Duke, which they used in the economy, grocery getter production, Chevy, Pontiac, etc. The three liter version, though, it was a marine engine. It was bigger than mm-hmm. the automotive mm-hmm. ones, which I mm-hmm. think were 153 cubic inch. I gave Jim the ability to drive the engine into detonation just by changing the boost pressure. Oh, yeah. So he would, here he again, could, you and I are doing the same thing, different places. Yeah. <laughs> Before we got yeah. together. <laughs> yeah, a- absolutely. <laughs> and we'll get to this, but without Jim's detonation sensor, he, you did a lab version of it. He used microphone, you might say. That works, yeah. And literally... I attached it in, into one of the drain plug holes, screwed it on the small block Chevy V8. Yep. That's where he started. And he screwed it in a drain plug hole, the one on each side for the water jacket, uh, radiator water. I think it was quarter pipe. The problem with it from the very first was if you had a hole in detonation, you couldn't tell which one. So you retarded or you drop boost or retarded spark or fuel <laughs> on the entire engine. Yeah. So it's a global change. Exactly. But it saved the Buick Turbo program. And I had an early version. Hugh worked on providing turbocharging for Buick 
and I think it was the Buick, it Indi- was the Indy Pace car would be 77. They, it was a Buick Century. And then for 78, they got the thing again. Uh, two years in a row, and I think I got it right, they turbocharged a V6 because this whole deal that Walt's talking about with the fuel economy and emissions and all of that, they developed a V6 at Buick in the 50s. A guy named Cliff Studaker led that engineering. And Cliff's son is a friend of mine on Facebook. That engine timed out, they shipped it. I think they sold the tooling to somebody in Brazil. They made the engine in Brazil for a while. And then we got into this whole, the 70s was hellish in terms of fuel economy and emissions right. and, and the beginning. government was That was brutal. the beginning of the EPA, yeah. really. And NHTSA was also in on it. Joan Claybrook, who ran I know. NHTSA. I, I, I know her. <laughs> yeah. I'll tell you some so, stories about that. Well, I did a job for her that involved a Volvo engine and a front drive. So in 80, we did a 454 horsepower Buick V6 prototype that was in Hot Rod Magazine. It's supposed to be on the cover. Herb Vischel, who was running performance there at the Under time. Under Lloyd Royce, right. Uh-huh. Yep. He came and met with the guys at Hot Rod Magazine. They never had a Buick on the cover. It was going to be on the cover. They shot the cover. I, I was in the cover photograph along with Junior Johnson because Daryl Waltrip was r- racing a Buick Re- Regal in NASCAR at that time. It was, in fact, a Mountain Dew, I think. Oh, yeah, I remember. It was the sponsor of the green car. So they had that Daryl's car in the photograph. The car that we powered and finished at, at Banks, which had a detonation prototype detonation sensor you on it. You probably patented it. I didn't. I didn't patent it. No, it was Jim Curry's. But I had a, I still got it somewhere, this equipment. Anyhow, it had a detonation sensor on it. So here's our car, Daryl's car, me and Junior, and one of my engines uh, with the twin turbos on it. In, the, in that photograph, it's supposed to be the cover of Hot Rod Magazine. The publisher lost his nerve. Oh, it won't, won't sell well on the newsstands. Oh, you know what I'm saying? Oh, it's got to be a Ford or a Chevy or something like that. So uh, some hot Buicks. So, so uh, we had a double truck, like a Playboy Playmate of the Month thing, in the middle of the magazine with that photograph. Fantastic. Yeah. yeah. And it said uh, Buick uh, Regal... Uh, Something that's got to be in the archives here somewhere. 80s. Oh I, yeah, I've seen it before. In yeah. fact, what started the Buick Turbo program, they bought the tooling back from whoever they sold it to for seventeen million dollars. Cliff Studaker's engine. They brought it back. They turbocharged it in a century, and paced Indy with it. Right. That was the pace car. Yeah. Right. And then I've got the motor trend in my office. Uh, it w- w- was on the cover of. Motor Trend, this Regal, I mean, this uh, Century pace car, and it said, Buick, will they do it in production, or something like that. Uh, And it says, I think it says turbo on the car and all of this jive. That started out as a Ray J turbocharger, and they got it to somewhere over 300 horsepower. It was a huge deal. But somehow, you guys got into it, I think. Well, this is... 78. The Buick Grand National and GNX didn't happen until 87. Yeah, we're talking about yeah. 70s here. Yeah, yeah. They didn't have a production turbo right. car. Right. No, they all. didn't. They did not. Absolutely yeah. not. This was, the Europeans did. This was their test, yeah. Buick's test, to make the anemic V6 powerful. Right. That never made it to any serial production until 78, to my knowledge. Well, there was no, there was no production, yeah. there was no production yeah. version of the century. Right, right. It, 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 they had... Turbo Regals, starting in what year? Production Turbo Regals. 87. No, that's the end of the program. That's, only, that's, what, that's when you did the GNX. But, you know, but I did the, before the, that, there was a Grand National. That was a production, and the GNX was a but limited. Before that, there was a carbureted version with a single Rochester I wasn't carburetor. involved in that at all. I was. Yeah, I wasn't involved in yeah. that Yeah. Okay, so I don't know who they bought the turbo from. It wasn't Ray J, I'll tell you that. So 78 was the pace car. If it was Garrett, I would have known. That 78 was the pace car, and it poses the question, is Buick going into turbocharging? Hmm. I did 
the, the twin turbo version in 80, but when did they start production of the turbo we'll Regal? Look, we'll have to look that one up. I, I'm, a, I'm in a fog on that one, so we didn't sell any production turbochargers for cars in America until later. We were doing all the Volvos, all the Saabs, Overseas. the German cars. Yes. Europe was way first. Yes. You know, and they did it in 78. Gotcha. They, they were going into mass production in 78. But when they went to fuel injection on the Regal, I think they went to your turbocharger. You what had, happened? Here's you had I, tall Jack back there. Yeah, Jack out. Gantz. Yeah. Jack well, this Gantz. is all part of the Garrett story. So we go back to the 72 Monte Carlo, right, program, mm-hmm. which was really a powertrain development program for the future. Yeah. And they wanted to see what could be done for fuel economy and emissions. So this was a complex thing where the reason we had the car more than anything else was to go to Hariba once we developed in the lab and run all the cycle tests, including the 24-hour coal soak test, because yeah. it had the coal. I mean, you, you, know, you and I know the big problem with the coal start is the killer, right? Mm-hmm. So this is all part of this whole never been done before thing is, you know. Will it be commercial? Yeah, can yeah. you make it work and pass EPA every yeah. time, right, on an audit? So besides that, it had to perform and it had to get fuel economy too. And you're using a carburetor? At that time, we were. Yeah. My boss, John Kazir, mm-hmm. Garrett Corporation, this is part of the problem. They never believed me when I said all cars should be turbocharged. <laughs> 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 but so when it finally came, they had a contract and they couldn't turn it down. You're living to see they, they couldn't turn it virtually down. Virtually all cars being turbocharged. Exactly. Worldwide. You're seeing it yeah. now. Yeah. 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 What a thing. What a thing. Yeah. But it was a long haul, right? Yeah. So. I, I got the job, mm-hmm. okay, for that program. And this, it's an interesting career story, and it's a corporate story, too. But So I went over there. I got the program. We didn't have – I had to go outside to get capability to do the vehicle work because we didn't do – we didn't work on cars, right? So I went to A.K. Miller, Ack Miller. Yeah. That's where you and I met. What year was that? It would have been like 71 or 72. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I, I would uh... – a guy named Jack Lufkin worked there. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And uh, I know big, Jack big, well. <laughs> big Bill Edwards. Yeah. yeah. And, I went to Bonneville with those guys. Well, a you were times. feeding them turbochargers. That's right. <laughs> yeah. And you weren't supposed to. Uh, I was kind of. You were back during. Um, I was a black ops guy. <laughs> yeah. I did a lot of things I wasn't supposed to do. Okay. I, I met those. <laughs> but I <guys>. stopped that. <laughs> yeah. I believed in something and nobody else did. So I had to find a way to feed it, right? Mm hmm. Mm hmm. And that's how you and I got together. First, I think, was when on boats. We met at, 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 Miller. at Miller's. Anyway, so we did this program. It was a success. We got funded. They the GM didn't put it into production for a long time. Mm-hmm. Uh, fortunately, I met guys like you and Ack Miller, which helped feed my my disease. We were the engine guys, the applications guys. You were the turbo guy, and the, and we're all. In it together. Right? Yeah. And we're, I mean, when we're all... Uh, they got, they got to talk to each other. We want turbocharged mm-hmm. engines in the stuff we drive. Right. And turbocharged... I wanted turbocharged engines in, uh, in the engines I was building for boats. Right. That's so, You and I first messed around with boats, with the twin turbo stuff. Mm-hmm. Right. And I gave oh, yeah. you... I got you the first water-cooled turbine housings, which I'd actually made for Caterpillar for bigger turbos and... I never patented that. There were so many core prints on that turbine housing. I've still got one. All you the plugs. Did, you did it looked one. like the chamber Nautilus. Remember? It did. <laughs> and I made you aluminum ones, right? Exactly. Nobody else aluminum, had those. Nobody had those but you. Aluminum water-cooled turbochargers. Nobody had those but you. The housing, turbine housing. I had to go to the foundry and twist some arms. To you get ought them. to see it. Do you still have one? Yeah, uh, Probably. Okay. You yeah. still have some stuff I want to see. Yeah, I haven't I, seen in a long time. Uh, we got to go to your garage. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I've got it. So, a lot got, of development turbochargers. That I didn't scrap. You got the 04 SO1s, I know that. That's another story. Yeah. But that's... that's. We'll get to that story, but I tried some of the, the conventional uh, V-trim, V2s, P-trim, V3s, V4s. Uh, T4s in a boat that I'd been running Ray J's in. It was a twin engine offshore boat. We tested down. Uh, well, we launched at Golden Avenue and uh, tested it in the Inner Harbor. I don't even think that Queen Mary was there at the time. When I nailed it out of the hole, it, un- it that's, unscrewed. That's an early one. <laughs> well, well that's, that looks like a Hallett single engine. Yeah, yeah that's, not, uh, the, yeah, that's yeah. not the big engine. Uh, and that's me and Walt in about a 24-foot boat there. Yeah. 
uh, what we used to call a day cruiser. Right. Um, I, I, that might be a 21 foot. The thing about the those turbos, when I punched it out of the hole, it unscrewed the compressor nuts. And uh, you later came up with a fix. It was for Smoky Unix uh, stuff, I think. IndyCar. Yeah. yeah. But it fixed my boat problem at the same time. And it, you, you were, I don't know if you were aware of my boat problem at that point, but. Um, I think you told me and I gave you a, tur- a Smoky Turbo. Is well, that, or, or this, a pair of them. That's, just, that's where that all happened. <laughs> yeah, all my, engines, all my engines were twin turbocharged. I didn't do it. Right. Right. Other, other than a prototype engine that I did for GM, uh, 1979, the little 229 cubic inch, 90 degree V6, they sent one to me, and uh, it's a whole marine industry story. But they were doing the same thing that you were doing with me, saying, hey, fuel economy in the boats, blah, 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 blah. We, we want to keep the marine industry alive because... Right. At the so, end of the Carter administration, the marine industry bellied up. He bellied up a lot of things. Yeah. So it made the cover of Powerboat Magazine, the engine, in the boat. That was my only single turbo marine engine. <laughs> they built about 2,500 turbo V6 Buick centuries. In what year? Uh, 79, 80. So they leveraged your work, yeah. that exposure. Uh, that's very cool. I would... That's not in my archives. I, I, yeah, this is not spe- specifically on, but 79 and 80 Century Turbo Coupe 3.8 liter V6 turbocharged. That's the predecessor to the Grand National. Yeah. So also the Turbo Regals. Yep. Uh, so I did a Turbo Regal in 80. I probably was aware of this Turbo Centuries. Sometimes they go offline and do the, you well, know, they, they drain your brain. But it was never they, a big thing. They only yeah. did 25. Well, that's why I didn't even know about it. That's an estimate. I never even knew about yeah. it. Yeah. I wasn't aware of it. Because, so. Because they wouldn't, nobody listened to me or you about cars should be turbo well, l- for a me, long time. Let me tell you, I, re- I recall talking to the Buick guys about the carburetor. And if you saw it, the, the turbo sat on the back of the engine on the carbureted Over model. Yeah. It was a draw-through. Sucked now, through. I've hated it. Sucked through. So right. it sucked fuel and It air. sucks. <laughs> and then it centrifuges the fuel out. It's, it's it atomized in the carburetor yeah. and then centrifuged out and, and comes out of the compressor discharge in a he- helix. We did a Lexan too. I wanted to know, when you run fuel or uh, uh, you water inject, uh, water methanol inject into, into the eye of the compressor, what the hell happens? You you get kind of a leaner air fuel mixture coming out than going in because a lot of the, the fuel is centrifuged back to and it's liquid and it's dribbles forming a helix. Yeah. In other words, the air coming out of the compressor is rotating, and this was was a way of seeing that rotation. But but it was either water, water methanol or gasoline you're looking at, and I went that's going to erode the compressor something fierce. You know, I did a number of those, but I always preferred the pressurized carburetor. I didn't like the pressurized carburetor in boats, though, Mm -hmm. because if you blow a gasket on a float bowl in the Mm -hmm. boat, the the boat becomes a bomb. Right. Boats are really hazardous. So I did draw-throughs, and and I used the Ray J's. They were rugged little spuds, Uh, but the biggest Ray J in a pair I only got 930 horsepower worth of air. That's all, and your stuff would go way beyond that. So you know, moving to Walt's wear, you know, his turbo wear. It's funny, a a consultant. You know, when I was doing that turbocharged integrated manufacturing thing for for Navistar, basically. Yeah, don't get to that yet. Don't get you to just that. said something. I'll, I'll remember it. Yeah, okay. You, 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 you trigger, okay. hit a trigger. We're kind of hung up here at the early '70s. Well, your your dyno and small block Chevys. You you've come up with your own detonation sensing equipment. Jim Curry's working on it at GM. That's not unusual. In though. the same I mean, time frame, yeah. uh, I would say early '70s. I end up building him a lab engine with a Ray J turbo on it, and probably a. Uh, I don't know where the waste gate come, came from. We didn't make it. We bought it somewhere. And there, we, made them, but, but we probably bought a Garrett wastegate. 
I might have bought it from Mac Miller. You I might have because yeah. he he had an inside track. Like, yeah, I mean, on ordering. Well, because well, I was an inside track. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know you were. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. so. Um, you solve your detonation problem ultimately. What happened? Well, we well we could. You could see we, it. We were online real time, so we could back out. There's so ins- you solved there's it by backing out. We it, incipient detonation, so we could do whatever we, we could control. However, we, you know. Yeah. So it, incipient detonation is borderline detonation. Yeah, right. It's very minor in scope. Uh, you can run a while and not kill the engine, but you don't want to. And sometimes it comes and goes. Yeah, it'll come in and out. Discriminating what cylinder you're on. You know, that all holes don't detonate at once. Nope. And, and back in the carbureted days, the air-fuel ratio was not uniform from not cylinder no, to cylinder. Not in the least. I used to, you know, you know, maybe you taught me this, but I ran different heat range spark plugs on my big block Chevelle. Mm-hmm. I had different plugs and different cylinders because just the way everything worked, right? If you dyno enough of them, you, yeah. you find You probably it told me the ones to use. But, well, yeah. I, I was running endurance marine big blocks. Our early boats uh, that we ran at the Parker 9 Hour were naturally aspirated in a Mandela center deck hull. And we did real well with them. And even there, I was staggered jetting. and 44s, I forget it now. You know, this whole idea of... You didn't know the air-fuel ratio. You read the plugs. That's right. We didn't, didn't have the instrument to do, do that. We had a little magnet. But Hariba did. When, and some of the early stuff had to do with reading air-fuel ratio. Per cylinder. And we, we were working with Hariba. Walt was obviously, you were aware of them. You were, must have been working with them. And... Um, they came up with a commercial version, which they were selling out of the, that facility. It, it had a Japanese to English translation. And, uh, here's, here's the manuals on this. And I started reading it. Yeah, the guy, we were sitting at the table, and I said, boy, this translation is a little cobby. You know, I, you know, I started laughing. The translation had a Japanese accent. It was like a guy, a, a Japanese guy who didn't really know all the nuance of the English language. Anyhow, we did the, the translation over for them. Good. You know, what does this mean? Oh, I mean, did the whole manual for them, just for the hell of it. You know, we worked with Hariba. I'm thinking of going back to them on some of my emissions stacks. Right, right. No, yeah. they're good at what they do. Yeah. They are good at what they do. Yeah. So you're on the dyno, you're running these engines. I got a vehicle, I'm testing a Hariba. Yep. I'm having to deal with cold starts, detonation, fuel economy. Right. All these things. Yes. You know. Anyway, the program was success. They didn't go into production, as we all know, but uh, at mm-hmm. that point in time. Mm-hmm. But uh, Europe did in 78, full scale, full bore. So what you, happened, a little backstory on Europe. I mentioned earlier, I mentioned our careers are so inter- intertwined. This is the point where we're going to discover, in maybe in this podcast, things we didn't know about each other. But, Walt, you may know this or maybe not. In 1975, a group of retired GM engineers had started a development company called Minicars, and they were at the airport up in Goleta. I didn't know that. Yeah. And they got a contract from NHTSA to build a crash-worthy car that met uh, 1985 proposed, this is 1970, 10 years ahead, proposed emission standards and uh, fuel economy, which I think was 27.5 miles per gallon. We did engine system, uh, used a Volvo B21 red block from a 242 car. We used a Lancia Beta front drive uh, and married the Volvo engine to that. So it was a front drive car and uh, turbocharged it. And it had something, detonation sensor is an, an essential ingredient, but, but so is sensing the air-fuel ratio, yeah, just, or, mm-hmm. or what the Swedes called, they, they had worked with Bosch to come up with the O2 sensor. And right. They called it lambda sound. Yeah, that's right. Lambda, you know, we say, hey, it's 12 to one air-fuel ratio. They speak of lambda, which is are you leaner or richer than the stoichiometric correct mixture, which is 
14.7 to 1? Like 14.5, 14.7. Yeah, yeah, right in there. That's unity. That's lambda. The tuners in Europe tend to talk lambda. I tend to talk just air fuel I ratio. I talk air fuel. Yeah. And uh, that's what we got from Hariba. We did the Volvo-powered crash car. It went to Washington, D.C. It was shown to Congress by Joan Claybrook's people, and probably her. And although it had never been emissions tested, it was tuned, it was performance tested, et cetera, but there wasn't enough time. She wanted it back there. So the claims were made falsely that that car did. But I got to know the Volvo guys. Those are really good engineers. Anyhow, we uh, ended up with uh, a program. Uh, There was some money in it, Two forty-two, and came up with a turbo layout. We even tooled the exhaust manifold casting like it was production. We put the O2 sensor in the exhaust manifold casting. We hung the turbo under it. We put the wastegate on top of it, so it d- didn't quite integrate the wastegate in, in, into the t- turbine housing, but it was right there. And then the outlets from the turbo and the wastegate came together beautifully, the smaller line from above merged into the turbine outlet pipe below. Uh, so that was very cool. And I learned a lot about O2 sensing. Okay. And, and they invented it, them and Bosch. Bosch usually really? finds an OEM to, to work with on new technology. And it was, it was Volvo on that one. So now we have Jim Curry's detonation sensor that was developed and first used on the Buick turbo engines. The early setup used, a, as I said, it was a Rochester four-barrel body. Quarter jet. It was a Q-jet, but yeah. it only used the front two barrels. It was a two-barrel. The big ones were blanked the out. The bi-jet. <laughs> yeah. The bi-jet. It only used it. And I'm arguing with these guys at Bu- Buick, you need to fuel inject this because of That's the, exactly. the weight. The compressor discharge was horizontal above the intake manifold. And it came to the, a center inlet on the intake manifold, so it made a 90-degree bend as if the fuel would make that bend efficiently. Well, it didn't. And so you ended up with the front holes of the engine were lean, I mean rich, and the rear holes were lean. And they had a warranty problem sticking the rear pistons in the bores. You know, the pistons were... right. We're back to metallurgy. <laughs> so they had a lot of warranty on the, those turbo engines. But I said in the meeting, why don't you... I couldn't tell them I'd worked on a fuel-injected engine with Volvo. But I'm going, you could EFI this thing. Bosch has injector stuff, nozzles right, and it has the stuff. stuff. Well, our 8-bit uh, engine controller is capable of that. And, you know, I don't know, I don't know, arguments. Finally, they had so much warranty that came up with a new fuel in, uh, system, which was now fuel injected, electronic fuel injected, and used your turbochargers. So I'm unclear on what year that transition took place. Okay, what the the timeline there is? Europe is way ahead with fuel yeah. injection, yep. which is critical to turbocharging to yep. the whole air fuel management. And, and Volvo went production in Europe about 1979 with 78. 78 with yeah, the turbo. Pretty much. Yeah. We were working on this in 1976. Right, right. That would make sense. And we sense. delivered the car. That would make sense. Yeah. Although the people at Garrett Air Research were not making turbochargers for automobiles domestically, they were into diesel. They were making turbochargers for automobiles in Europe. Yep. Volkswagen, Volvo. In the late 70s, right. Yeah. But here... We started using turbochargers to set records or win championships in boats and cars in the mid-70s. That's right. In 1975, we did Hurry Round Hondo, uh, which was a Hondo boat with a jacuzzi jet drive, as I recall, a twin-turboed alcohol Banks big block Chevy marine engine. It it was injected. Uh, Stu Hilborn provided the injection. It was analog, no digital here. It wasn't as refined as you might want it. And Walt supplied, he had come up with a turbocharger that guys were using at Indianapolis on the Offenhausers. 
the TE06. So he supplied those turbochargers to me. And the wastegates. And a big wastegate made for a Waukesha stationary engine, as I recall, but perfect for this. Big valve. And these were TEO-691s. That's right. We ran them in a hurry round Hondo. In its first race, at the end of the first lap, we were half a lap ahead of the competition. There's a guy named Jack Cool, who was a Marine race photographer. He had a gun stock mounted camera, oh, yeah. and he pulled the trigger to fire the camera, and he was right at the start-finish line. We were coming across the start-finish line at the end of the first lap. The supercharged nitro-burning boats were just a half a mile behind us. In one mile, we had a half a mile on the competition. That's how fast this boat was. Rick Lee was driving the boat. I think he was in sales at Hondo at the time. He gets down to that front straightaway. He goes to turn, and the boat swamped with water. The thrust, the pressure in the bowl of the jet drive had pushed the impeller forward, stacked up the H-bar, the little short dual U-jointed prop shaft, so to speak, drive shaft, and wiped out the rear thrust on the rear main in the engine. In doing this, the impeller had machined (laughs) through the intake intake housing. So he lifts the throttle. The impeller's not pushing water out the back anymore. It slows down, and we had this huge leak. The boat went down at the stern. Hot turbos, you know, all of it in salt water. This is at Marine Stadium in Long Beach. We knew we had to really gotten a hold of something, <laughs> and those turbos matched the engine beautifully, absolutely perfectly. In fact, we had so much power uh, thereafter, uh, the wastegate couldn't handle it, so I put a stop, an adjustable stop under the throttle pedal, uh, and I limited the throttle position to 5 eighths throttle, and he still drove away from everybody. I didn't change the manifold. We, we, we solved the problem with the jet drive by water cooling the front bearing on the jet drive and then lubing the, the bearing with a, a graphite lithium type of grease. I had a grease gun next to the driver's seat. Oh. Every straightaway, he gave it a pump. <laughs> you know, he just reached down and gave it a pump. We made the jet drive live a five mile heat. That's all we needed. We had to keep the pump alive for the whole race day. If you weren't running, you, you, you know, had heat races, and then the winners of those had the final race. And I got to tell you, uh, we made it work. It was a K boat, an unlimited engine. Okay. So you could run supercharging, turbocharging, nitromethane, alcohol, whatever you wanted to do. And it's basically an 18 foot boat. V bottom, runner bottom, or different types. The V drive, conventional prop K boats were the badass hot rods. They were unbeatable until we got them to agree to let us, in an exhibition race, race the hot K boats with the jet drive. Really? Yeah. Oh, they let you do that? They let us do it one time, and we beat them all. They never you let got, us do it again. You had the power, and you yes. kept it together, and you kept yes. it together. The turbocharging, you cannot go to sleep at night and dream of the power you can make with turbocharging, period. Okay. It is insane. Walt gave us, sponsored us with this equipment, and at the same time, Pontiac had asked us, you know, they, they came out with the 82 Firebird, and it, it was probably one of the first cars to ever be in the GM wind tunnel, developed in the wind tunnel. It was designed to be slippery. Oh, the Firebird was a piece of work. The 82. I mean, that was like a Blackbird car. At the time. Yeah. I mean, the drag coefficient, ultra low. Yeah. What was Uh, it? Like two, five, uh, two, seven? Low threes. We got it it, it, down into the twos. Yeah, that's Uh, that's pretty slippery. (laughs) But John Shanella led that design effort on the F body for 82. He took styling clues. There's some 53 Studebaker Starlight Coupe. Oh, my. In that car. Oh. And, and the 82 Firebird. That and was, That was another car and I wanted. <laughs> there's some Ferrari in that car. So 
styling cues. They asked me to set records with that car at Bonneville. So since I had this marine engine worked out, we decided, hey, let's just take this marine setup. Why not? You know, <laughs> uh, and put hot headers, and but keep the water jacketed uh, intercooling, uh, all of that jive. So we were running programs in boats and in the recursetic firebirds. And even previous to that, the first application w- was right about 1980. Let me think about this. Yeah, we're in the 80s. We, yeah. w- right, we had this 68 Corvette that we were running at Bonneville, me and two partners. I was the engine guy, and maybe I sponsored the transmission too. We rigged it in my shop it's in San Gabriel. And it was the first brutally fast door slammer, street legal car to run at Bonneville. Most guys who are in the 210, 205, 202, running blown Chryslers and blown big block Chevys and all. We went out with that Corvette, which at 68 is not a very aerodynamic car. It's kind of pretty, though. It's very pretty, but... <laughs> I had a 69 427. So... <laughs> Be nice. <laughs> Chanel told me our, our Firebird is far more slippery. In fact, if you ran the, the 68 in reverse in other words don't don't say this yes yeah. it would be faster going backwards than it would forward because Damn. it's more aerodynamic that direction i said what do you mean he said it, it would be like firing an arrow feathers first ah <laughs> he great. says if you want to go at least 20 miles an hour faster and bob dorn uh, was in this conversation okay. he ended up at cadillac he, didn't he i think he went from cadillac because I visited him at Cadillac in, in the mid-70s. I, he went from there to Pontiac, and he did the uh, North Star I had one of those at too. Cadillac. And then he went to Pontiac, and he was chief engineer at Pontiac. So it was Bob Dorn and John Chanella. Chanella did a paint scheme for the car the first year we ran it, which was red, white, and blue. The Corvette went 240. We went 260, first time out with the Firebird. This is Cosmic. They both said, you're going to go 20 miles an hour faster, same powertrain. We went 20 miles an hour faster with the same powertrain. It was error. Yeah. So now we're at 260, and this is mid-80s. And then we came back and made it an 87 GTA, and we went 268 two-way. Best mile was 277. Back door was 283 miles an hour. I, that's the number I remember. Yeah. Okay. I was going to say... I remember 283. <laughs> and we held the we held the car right there because we had tested the front and the rear tires at Smithers Scientific in Akron. And the fronts, which were Mickey Thompson's, blew up at 280 miles an hour on the test rig. Now, I knew we had some overhead over the test rig on the salt, but I didn't want to risk Stringfellow's life. He was driving it down Stringfellow. So... We went 283, and that was it. There's a 300 in the car. and some, I, knew, you know, I, some was, of, I was waiting for 300. Well, I knew I could do it. The guy that was my engine guy here, Mike Lefevre, good craftsman, he had left. I don't know if he went where, where he went, but some friends built a car similar to what we had done. This is years later. Mike built the engine, and they went over 300. I think 303. I remember that number. Yeah, but it was a number of years later that they finally achieved that. But I want you to talk about these TEO 691s. The turbo specifically, I use it as a tool everywhere. I remember you talking about turbine wheel out of MARM or MARN. Yeah, for temperature. Oh, well... See, this is kind of like the jet engine thing uh, again. Uh, you, but, but you started supporting the Indy guys. What year, year did you do that? Was it the 60s? A 68 or something like this? It's in the okay. 60s. Because the offy was being yeah. they were, overwhelmed. Yeah, it was in the 60s, I think. I'd have to. Well, you, you went to Garrett. See, in the I 60s. didn't get to the turbo thing until the early 70s. They That's were already what, doing Indy. Oh, they were? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. They were already doing Indy before I got there with the TEO 6s. Well, I remember you talking about you were. Now running it. This is in the early Well, what 70s. happens is everybody wants more and more. I'm just saying it was first applied earlier than I got there. Yeah, gotcha. But you get, it's like the SR-71 Blackbird engine. Everything is, for power, 
is temperature limited in metallurgy. Mm-hmm. It's the same thing with like turbine blade failures, whether it was a low cycle for fleet or, or thermal fatigue sure. combined with cycles. Yes. So we had to keep upgrading the alloy of the nickel in the in the turbine wheels. So we were up else, to seven. Inco I went up to seven thirteen and yeah. RM and because gasoline engines are so much hotter than diesels, you see. And the Indian yeah. engines were gasoline early, yeah. But until they all the wrecks, and then they converted to to methanol. To methanol. So Mar is it Mar M? It's called Mar M. But see, we always made air, we also made aircraft turbos. Uh huh. So that was an alloy you were right. using for safety and durability. Right. And, Shaft speed. We had our own foundries. How about the turbine housing? Ni resist. They were primarily. They were could be ductile iron. Then we go to Ni resist. We keep adding nickel to deal with the yeah the thermal requirements. So it goes. What, it would go up. You know. Was the racing use? You were already doing MRM for aircraft. It sounds mm-hmm. like we were. How how about the compressor slipping on the shaft? Okay. And this you will, you did a l- lobed shaft. Like a, something like yeah, that. Yeah, with a tricordal. There you are. With a tricordal shaft. Right? Yes. It was like a cam, only, only it had, it was like it was like a wonkle. Yes. It was like a wonkle. It looks like engine. a rotor in a wonkle. It, it looked like a rotor in a wonkle. So, but here, <laughs> did you broach that uh, in a compressor wheel? How did you? Yeah, we broached it. Uh, we broached it. So this is like lobes. The wheel cannot slip on the shaft, period. Was that for Indy or was that for aircraft or how did that happen? I remember doing it. I can't. I, I remember. I think you, it was I more. I remember you telling me about it. It was for. It was for racing. It wasn't for air. It was. Oh, that's a, what I figured. It was not a business. Yeah. It. it was not business. Yeah. Air research supplying that big turbo for the Offenhausers. You know the Offenhauser. What size was the two twenty five? I mean, I can't remember the size because Offies came. In. They were much smaller because they had dual overhead cams and. Yeah, they, they were, were 159, weren't they? Ah, yeah. the turbo offies were 159. That's what I remember. Yeah, 159 cubic inches, right at three liters. Right at. Down at the Champion Dino in Long Beach. The building was right there off the Long Beach freeway. Dick Jones. I knew right? Dick Jones. Yeah. He gave me my magnifying glasses to read my spark plugs. There you go. He had a little light. He was the champion guy. Yeah, I still have at that the races. <laughs> He'd go to all the major races. and it, We didn't have... O2 sensing. Read the plugs? You read the plugs. I had a color uh, on the porcelain I called 12 to 1. You know, somebody say, what, what's the right color? I say 12 to 1. It's just light gray. Yeah. You know. Yeah, light so, gray, brown, black, well, yeah, all the shades. You read a plug everywhere. Yeah. You don't read it in one place. I, I don't want to get into reading spark plugs because it's, it, it's a, kind of a lost art form. I'll tell you one thing. When we ran uh, the Crucifier drag boat, which was not turbo, it was in- injected late model Chrysler on 100% nitro. I knew I had a good run with that boat when the ground straps were gone off the spark plugs. <laughs> Literally, oh, yes. Just gone. They weren't <laughs> oh. even there anymore. Oh, maybe a little numb. A little. Yeah. But you, you, we went through a lot of spark plugs. Pretty brutal stuff. We well, could read the detonation room, too. You could see yeah, I, you could see I, the little little bubbles. When we ran the cyclone project at Bonneville, which uh, was not turbocharged, and I kept leaning it out and bumping the timing, and suddenly there were little specks on the porcelain, and the guys from GMC are going, and we had just gone 199 miles an hour. With a 175 goal, I was 24 miles an hour faster than the goal, and I show this spark plug, to this guy from GMC, and he's going, can we go 200? I said, mm-hmm. do you want, we had the press there. We Learjetted in, in two plane loads of press out of Van Nuys. And I said, we'd been there for like four days. We Off the trailer, we, we broke the international record for the class, FIA. We had FIA timers there. Every room run, we'd bump the record a, a little more. And um, we were in the mid 190s brought the press out to see it we proceeded to break the record a couple more times approaching 200 with the press there so they're there and i i said the guy uh, from gmc you see those little speckles uh-huh. that's piston that's pistons. <laughs> yeah, know. you know oh i said it will not pee another drop you're done we're 24 miles an hour faster than, than, than our goal, goal. 
Our original goal is a nice number anyway. I like that. Well, our original goal was 200. Brock had asked me to help him with a sport truck image. John Rock was running GMC, and he'd asked me to help him. So we came up with a twin turbo injected big block, you know, like a 502 cubic inch big block uh, and a half ton pickup, short bed, all that. And the Chevy guys took it away from us. So suddenly, the cyclone. A was lot of born. internal competition. Yeah, but the cyclone was born right there. Uh, and I've talked about this in previous podcasts. So if you guys want to hear about it, listen to the series. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of cool sh. And this is the 11th one. There's going to be a lot more. Let's get back to, to Walt here now. This is an interesting tilt. So it's, this, let's just say 71, 72. Mm-hmm. And I got the job in the turbo business, right? Yep. And uh, I came in. I came in under another guy who was, he was like the Caterpillar worldwide engineer, but he loved cars. Okay, yeah. you probably never met him. Chuck McInerney was his name. I remember McInerney. Okay, and the, yes, the Caterpillar guys called him like three names because it was Irish. It was Chuck Mac and Ernie. Yeah, <laughs> they called him like three guys. Chuck right? Mac and Ernie. Right. Chuck Mac anyway, and Ernie. <laughs> anyway, he was like the superstar Garrett turbo engineer when I got there. So I came in under him to do the Monte Carlo program because there was nobody to do it. And he had Caterpillar, so he couldn't do it, right? Yeah. So anyway, we did the whole thing. So we satisfied GM. It was a success. Yeah. I wrote like a master thesis, and I delivered, hand-delivered to the president about why and how all cars should be turbocharged. Yeah. I'll, it's in archives. i got to see it again. Yeah. On it, he wrote, very naive. John, <laughs> uh, cars are never going to be freaking turbocharged, oh right? Oh my God! I, I swear. So then after Did that, Mac and Ernie also agree with John. You know, it was Chuck Mac and Ernie, right? Yeah, it was. Yeah. That was just, <laughs> I just said, yeah. Walt was a different guy. Yeah, it was probably. So I don't give up easy, as as you well know, on anything. If it's broke, I want to fix it, right? Anyway, I was kind of like I was floored a little bit because what I was twenty, I wasn't thirty. I was twenty something. Yeah, you know, and I thought I had this great plan, right? It's just something I wanted to do. Maybe it wasn't a good plan at all, but I thought it was. He didn't think it was. The whole corporation didn't think it was. Yeah. So then it's okay. Well, what am I gonna? What am I gonna do next? Now, okay, I'm working for Chuck Mac and Ernie. I guess I was still fiddling around with cars, trying to do something, but there was no funding, right? Yes. And so one day, I got called into the president's office. John, the guy that thought my thing was naive, mm-hmm. and he said, "You know, well, you know, we'd kind of like you to." Uh, you know, become the Caterpillar engineer. And I said, well, John, you know, you know, I really believe in turbocharging cars. And again, he told me that gasoline engines in particular and cars as well were never meant to be turbocharged, right? Nah. And I'm saying, well, you know, I really believe in this, right? Anyway, he said, well, you know, I'd really like you to think about this because you know, I don't know what, what they had done with me, but but because they didn't want to do cars, but um, you really, we'd really like you to think about this. So. He asked me about two more times. We got up all the way to Christmas vacation. And so he, one more time he asked me, and I said, oh, okay, John, you know, let me just think about over Christmas vacation. Right? Yeah. I didn't want to do it, right? Right. Flat out. To me, diesels are big, clunking. They don't turn RP. They don't At go. that time. They don't. Anyway, yeah. I went home for Christmas, and I came back. And I never went in and said, oh, I'll, I'll do it, right? This is, I could close my eyes and see this. So, And so it was a terrible rainstorm. It's pouring down, and people stand in the lobby. You know, when it quits, everybody runs with their car, right? Yeah. And then it comes back, and then there's lightning and thunder, and so we're all standing there, and I'm kind of like, and I get this tap on my shoulder, and I turn around, and it's John. And I think, oh heck, right? He caught you. He says, you know, you really ought to decide if you want a hobby or a job. <laughs> oh. So I have kids, right? I have like three kids, right? Yeah, yeah. And I said, John, you know what? You know, I think I like to do the caterpillar thing. <laughs> <laughs> that made up your mind that was, right there. That was a big career change. Yeah. So I ended up doing that for years, right? Did you live in Peoria? I never had a residence there. Uh huh. I spent a whole lot of time there. Okay. Yeah. And then it turns out it's just the way things work. And it's part of the history because Caterpillar literally started Garrett in a turbo business. Yep. I'll bring you something that I found over the weekend about kind of the history of that. It goes all the way back to Ted Von der Noel and Helmut Schulp and all that. Mm-hmm. But, and they were part of the of team that evaluated the Caterpillar Turbo. Yes. And of course, they were turbo experts from Germany, right? Yeah. But we didn't make turbos, we made turbine engines. But I guess Von der Noel must have had a soft spot in his heart for it. So 
you'll have to read that separately. It ends up, so I say, okay, I'll do it. So then, like, I had to interview with Caterpillar, right? Because they decide, they tell, they basically tell Garrett how to run the business. I mean, at the board level. So then I go back with Chuck McInerney and Walt. So we go there about three or four trips. And uh, it, it was kind of a fraternity, actually, because Gal- Caterpillar is committed to turbos. They were committed, absolutely, for power density to do more work. It's about doing work, right? Work per unit time. That's what it is. That's horsepower. And they want to move a lot of dirt. So in a, they were kind of jokers, too. Some of them, I got to know them really well. One of them, a guy named John McCornack. So then they gave me kind of like at one of the things were back there. They gave me like a pop quiz, right? The whole room's full of me and Chuck and McInerney and about right. a table full of Caterpillar. And it was it was kind of like a setup, you know, it was a roast, I guess. So they're giving me this quiz, right? And anyway, I'm like, what the hell? You know, anyway, so we did all that. And so then it ends up, this, this ironic, it ends up that uh, Caterpillar was not happy with Chuck McInerney. Oh. So it ends up. They ended up, I guess they liked me okay, right? Yeah. Chuck went on to do cars, <laughs> ah! whatever they were doing. Oh, yeah. And he really wanted to do it anyway. Oh, my Not God. as much as me. He was yeah. never as committed as me, right? So, but what it turns out is, for whatever reason, I don't know, Chuck McInerney, Chuck was a really smart guy. We go, we had kids the same age. We go camp, dirt bike, dune buggy. I mean, we were buddies. Mm-hmm. And I don't know, maybe he was burned out or whatever, but they were pressuring the corporation. They wanted a new guy. I didn't know any of that. I mean, I came in as an understudy, and I figured I was going to carry his briefcase or whatever. Right. Not that I would have done that for very long. But anyway, so after I don't know how many visits, it was like all these people, you know, I had to decide whether I was okay or not. <laughs> I guess it was like meeting the parent, the in-laws. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I didn't know until later. So then pretty soon, like, okay, well, Chuck's going to go do Cars Walt, and you're going to do Caterpillar full-time. I'm like, okay. <laughs> yeah. So then I go there. And we were, you'd be familiar with us, but we were coming out with that whole TV series of turbochargers. Yes. The first ones with V-bands, yes. moving from bolted, all bolted connections. To V-band. Yeah, TV, six, 51, 61, 71, 81, 91, T, 101, they were like in development. They were not in production. And Cat was not very happy with a lot of the things. Yeah. Because they ran, they ran all kinds of destructive tests of their own. They ran turbine burst, burst containments. They ran. They did it all. They had their own laboratory. They were in their own turbocharger laboratory, right. right? So they they weren't happy, and I guess maybe Chuck wasn't getting it done what they wanted. I don't know. So then all of a sudden I'm I'm the guy, right? So then I go back there, and it's just me and the guys, the cat, and they're saying, like, "Look, Walt, there's this, this, we don't that, 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 on and on. We're not happy." And I'm like, but obviously they had told the people upstairs they weren't happy. So I'm going there and I'm listening and I'm taking notes and all this stuff. And I did it for a couple of trips, a couple of trips, deep immersion. And uh, I met the plant manager. I met all these people. They all had their, whatever their beefs. That was kind of the beginning of my, I guess, career at doing more than just pure engineering. And so I came back and so John Kazir and Hans Egli, John was CEO and president and a hell of an engineer. And Hans Egli was, he was a German engineer, right? I mean, he was smarter than hell. I come back and I... It was like in the afternoon, they said, okay, they, they want to debrief. So I had like a, I guess I went to the chalkboard because I had all handwritten notes and stuff. So I started outlining all the things where, and I said, well, these are all the things that I aren't happy about. I mean, I'm like stressed out, right? This is, we got all through and they said, kind of, okay, you've dumped your bucket. Now go home and come back tomorrow and tell us what you're going to do about it. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm like, I mean, literally like yeah. that. Yeah. I mean, I went home with like a migraine headache. I got home. For dinner, and I, didn't, I don't think I even ate dinner. I'm like, what the hell am I going to tell them? You know. Mm-hmm. So anyway, I went back, and it was another. This is like grueling, right? And uh, I went through that, and I said, well, look, mm, I think we should do this, we should do that. And by the way, I can't do it all by myself, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, there's a lot to be done, and so it took a while, but they gave me pretty much what I needed, and I ended up being stuck doing Caterpillar for the rest of my career because. I never got rid of it, even when I was president. Oh, my God. Even when I was in Europe and running the European thing, the Caterpillar guys all came to, because we made turbos for Caterpillar in, in the UK, right? Mm-hmm. So they came, they had dinner at my house, a catered dinner and all that. I mean, we ended up being like a, 
It was kind of a club. It was fun stuff. It was. It so was you old. never got rid of Caterpillar. No, because uh, because you, it, we, we would go to the board if I didn't get it fixed, right? <laughs> uh, of course. So, but you did satisfy them. I did for, and forever. And, and, and you, won. they gave me a going away party when I resigned. Well, Caterpillar did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When you resigned from, from Garrett. Garrett. So, I want to wrap uh, Caterpillar. We're going to get to another flip point, which is really pivotal. This is. John DeLorean and wanting to win Indianapolis with a small block Chevy. Exactly. I had Caterpillar. Exactly. So so you satisfied Caterpillar. Garrett became the dominant supplier of turbo product to Caterpillar until they realized one day uh, that you were over the, we had their 85%. 50%. You had, had 85% eight. of their business. You know at the SAE World Congress? Mm-hmm. We went back, and they had a suite. There's all these guys now, big dogs from... I went into, everybody had suites there, right? Yeah. And so they invited Cat- me to the Caterpillar suite. Yeah. Only I was the only guy invited. <laughs> ah. And I'm sitting there, and they're saying, well, look, you know, we have a corporate yeet duct that we never let one supplier, no, no matter what the product is, have more than 50%. Our purchasing department just will not stand with that. And they, like, board level stuff, right? Yep. And he said, you guy, you right now, you're 85%. And if you win this new 3208 program, <laughs> and so they said, you know, we, we really got to, yeah, yeah, we want you, we need you, we like you, but, you know, we got to work something out here. <laughs> yeah. So somebody else supplied the 3208 Switzer. program. Switzer. For a uh, while. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> we finished with CAT. Now we're going to move on to something Back really exciting. Yeah. We're going to talk about John DeLorean. Smoky Eunuch. Smoky Eunuch. Herb Fischl. The whole thing. This is stuff I know you guys have never heard before. This is inside. In fact, a lot of this pod today is inside stuff. This is episode 11. Episode 12 is going to really be dynamite. Be sure to subscribe for more episodes of Speed School with Dale Banks. If you like the show, please leave us a review on your Apple Podcast app or on Spotify. It helps us to reach more gearheads. Talk to you soon.